Okay. So Don Shen, this is, they were being talking about salvia, red sage root. <clears throat> Salvia, or what we call red sage root. The Latin of this is the salvia milterizer. This is actually a common landscaping plant that you can buy all over town. I actually used to grow it, I mean, a lot of years ago. So it is in the salvia or sage family, but it doesn't necessarily function like a sage. So sometimes this is called red sage. Um, sometimes this is called Chinese salvia. Sometimes this is called red sage root. In Chinese medicine, this is just called don shed. Don Shen. So Don Shen, Don um, often means reddish or red or purplish. Shen obviously means spirit. This is actually one of the five legendary spiritual plants of Chinese medicine also. Um, I'll pass this around. Uh, <laughs> this is somewhat common in America, like it's getting more common. You know how we talked about Hawthorne and it's literally just like the most beneficial herb for the heart and all the amazing things it does for the heart and what that seems like everything imaginable. This is just the Chinese version of that. The main difference is that Don Shen has a much more powerful blood thinning property and blood moving property that Hawthorne doesn't necessarily have. Um, which makes it really, really, really good for clotting and blood clots. So I'll pass this one out. Really easy herb to grow in your yard. I'm sure that aerial portions are probably used and have some benefits since it's a sage family herb. Um, but, but we mostly use the root for what we're gonna be talking about today. Okay. This is often in Chinese medicine and old Chinese medicine, this is called the herb of the heart spirit. Because we have like five shens, there's five different plants that affect the five internal organs. This is the main one for the um, heart. So it often obviously <clears throat> combines well with what other famous Chinese heart herb, or not herb, but mushroom. Reishi. So one of the greatest combinations that we have is red sage with reishi mushroom. So its energy is cool, without doubt. Its action, its directionality is outward because it's a circulatory stimulant. So there's some differences between this and Hawthorne that we'll we'll look at, but um, let's start with just the cardiovascular effects of this plant. So red sage root is one of the classic, the classic heart tonics in Chinese medicine. And by heart tonic, we mean something that has a broad spectrum, strengthening, you know, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effect <laughs> on the heart, just like hot water. Um, So when we have someone that has any, literally any kind of heart problem, any kind of heart disease, any kind of family history of heart problems, this is the herb we're going to use. When people have the big um, puppy earlobes, the big creases in the earlobes, people have the purplish tongue, the red tip, when people have all these cardiovascular indicators, the reddish face or the purplish face, um, the purplish nose, all those types of things, we're going to immediately think of the herb that combines really well with Hawthorne Berry, for sure. Um, so this herb has an effect on both the heart and 
the blood vessels. So it's not only a heart tonic, it's also a blood vessel tonic. Very similar to Don Kwai. Do you remember what Don Kwai did that was, he said, unique amongst all plants? <clears throat> we weren't totally honest when we said that. Remember <laughs> what it does that's really unique? What kind of blood mover? So Don Kwai was both a blood tonic and a blood mover. And Chinese red sage root is the same. It is both a blood tonic and a blood mover. So the question becomes, what's the distinction? And here's the clinical insight is that Dong Guai is a little bit more heavily favored as a blood tonic as most of its action strengthens the blood and a smaller percent of it moves the blood where the red sage root is a reverse. The majority of its effects are moving the blood and thinning the blood where only a small percentage of it actually tonifies the blood. But it still makes it a safer option, right? Because like we said, in, especially in Chinese medicine, we get really concerned about moving circulation, that the effect of moving blood and circulation can actually weaken the blood to some degree. This is one of the really in-depth nuances of Chinese medicine. So this herb, bypasses all those concerns and just does it all. So it's often obviously <laughs> combined with Dong Kwai for like thousands of conditions. So, okay, so with the heart, we're gonna use this for people that have actual heart disease, have had a heart attack, have artery disease, blocked arteries, congested arteries, people that have had stents, people that have had heart catheterization, people that have had strokes. Um, this is also one of the main herbs we're gonna to try to use to help prevent heart disease, like Hawthorne. This is one of our main cardio preventatives. We, there's a lot of studies that show it can help prevent the likelihood of strokes, heart attacks, heart disease. Um, the effects of red sage root are so strong that in a lot of parts of China and hospitals, it's actually given as an injection during or right after a heart attack or heart surgery because it's been shown to protect death of the heart tissue. Like if you do you have an actual heart attack, part of the problem is part of your heart dies and it can eventually kind of regain function and come back to life somewhat, but it's usually avoids losing some function. It's been shown to help prevent that from happening some, but to also reverse the effects of it afterwards. What's often used during heart surgery, after heart surgery, during heart attacks, after heart attack, as an injection or as an IV. We don't have access to that here. Although one of my teachers, long time ago, had the injections of it somehow. Um, okay. So we're gonna use this for poor circulation anywhere in the body. <clears throat> what is unique about red sage root that should be really emphasized is that it actually increases blood flow to every organ and tissue. No other circulation herb that I know of does that, meaning it affects the brain, the liver, the kidney, the spleen the liver, um, the intestines, the stomach, it increases blood flow to every, every part of the body. And that's why it's used so much in Chinese medicine because you can use it to literally improve the health of any organ. So um, we use it anytime people have heart palpitations, chest pressure, chest pain, shortness of breath, we use it anytime people have poor circulation and blood flow. Um, we use this, it was one of our main, we talked about this herb for hypertension. Remember, this was one of our main top, probably five herbs for hypertension. Um, 
That's why it does not interact with hypertensive medications, but it can lower blood pressure by itself. So we just want to be aware that if we give this to someone on a blood pressure medication, we want to make sure we're monitoring the blood pressure <clears throat> because it can lower it. This is a great herb to help people wean off of blood pressure medication or if people have to go off of a certain blood pressure medication. This is it, it, okay. Um, the only challenge with it is that it, it really does make the blood less thick, less clotted, less clumpy. So um, we call that an anti-thrombotic in herbal medicine. And this is a anti <laughs> which is a big fancy name for saying it just, it helps blood flow by making your blood less sticky, okay? It's not like we talked about, it's not like a true actual blood thinner from the sense of exactly like warfarin or a prescription blood thinner, but it is gonna make your blood less thick and viscous, but just doesn't thin like a prescription medication. But that's the one interaction with this um, plant is that it will make blood thinners work too good. So we do not combine it with blood thinners, which gets really frustrating. Like, I'd love to give this after people have stent sometimes and heart surgery, but we can go their off of blood thinners. So it's just it's very strong. Way more blood way more circulatory effects than hot or anything. Okay. Okay. So we also use this for like true angina or chest pain. Like when people are having pain in their heart from heart disease, it's a tonic in Chinese medicine, not a true adaptogen, but pretty close. So it's used a lot for people that have a weak heart or have had a heart surgery or have like severe hypertension and they're just really weak, tired, out of breath, out of shape. Okay. There is a famous Chinese formula called Don Shen Yin. Um, which is one of the classic uses of this formula. Um, it has red sage. It has all. <laughs> it has red sage. It has cardamom. <clears throat> And it has sandalwood. Okay. So red sage is very cooling, cardamom is very warming, sandalwood is kind of slightly warming. So it's this really classical, like we see in a lot of complex formulas, there's cooling with warming, right? But the warming, the cooling part predominant, like these are only like 10% and 10% of the formula. This is 80%. So this formula is used for like about a thousand different things. And there's research connecting them just about any kind of major organ problem. So it was originally invented for when people had a lot of like what we would probably call ulcer pain or chest pain, pain like in the chest and stomach from unknown digestive or other disturbances or maybe heart disease. So the cardamom obviously is really carminative. It helps like gas and bloating. And the sandalwood drives it kind of deeper into the heart because it's a very heart-directed herb. Um, so this is traditionally used for severe like digestive ulcers and stomach ulcers and ulcer pain. Um, but in modern research, it's now used more for like heart disease, <laughs> 
heart disease, uh, blood pressure, angina, chest pain. But it's also been recently researched to be one of a very powerful formula for autoimmune disease. So in that way, Red Sage Root has recently, in the last probably 20 years, been really heavily researched for autoimmune conditions. It has a immune modulating effect on an overactive immune system. So what's really unique about red sage for autoimmune conditions is, like we said, it has that effect of increasing micro blood flow to all the internal organs and tissues of the body. So no matter what your autoimmune disease is attacking, whether it's your joints or your intestines, red sage roots are always helpful. It's also extremely anti-inflammatory across the board. It just is, Works is different than how turmeric works, but it's very anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, so we use this for all kinds of autoimmune diseases, especially like um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We use it for weird blood vessel diseases that are kind of more autoimmune-like. Mm -hmm. We use this for Wounds, like when people get what we call vascular ulcers, where they have wounds that won't heal because of poor blood flow. Um, this herb itself is actually used for healing wounds internally to heal your external wounds. Um, else there. So we use it especially for scleroderma. That's the autoimmune disease where you start to turn to stone and the blood flow gets more and more restricted. Um, we use it for rheumatoid arthritis, MS, ALS, everything. With MS, it's been shown to prevent mm -hmm. inflammation and lesions in the brain, worsen some. So this herb. And we're probably not used only that way in ancient time, maybe, but this is like a, a good modern insight into it. Um, so any autoimmune disorder, which would be Hashimoto thyroiditis, right? Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, eczema, um, colitis, ulcerative colitis, any kind of autoimmune circulatory disorder, or some of those. Where your immune system might affect your blood vessels and you get these the ulcers and things. That you use that formula or just the red sage or either, either one. Yeah, this this formula to me is just a little bit better suited when people are having like ulcer pain. Okay. Like pain in the chest it's really bad. <laughs> Nicholas, can people take it if they have those? You can take this herb if you have low blood pressure, but you just need to make sure, yeah, you don't go too low. <laughs> if you have low blood pressure, you know, we would combine it probably like with ginseng or licorice okay. to help your low blood pressure. Okay. So yeah, it's used for clotting disorders a lot. Okay, so immune system, that's pretty broad spectrum. Oh, it's also been shown to be really helpful for the autoimmune connective tissue disorders. Like um, Ehler, I can never say that, Ehlers. Ehlers, Ehlers downloads. Yeah. Ehlers I just call it EDF. EDS. Not to be converted, confused with the other EDS. Uh, EDS. Um, any kind of connective tissue. So we also use it for tendonitis, bursitis. God, one of the most secret use of this herb that I have blown people's mind with again and again. So this is an herb that targets blood flow, right? So in Chinese medicine, there's this idea called the 50 year shoulder. And it sounds kind of hokey, like, oh, yeah, people age, blah, blah, right? But well, I don't know why. When often people turn 50, they develop, like, shoulder bursitis, tendonitis type things, or arthritis. 
And I've had a couple of clients that have had this. Uh, ironically, all of them have been kind of like not natural medicine people. So they kind of came in a bit hefty, like suspicion and eh, but, you know, like no one, none of the rheumatoid doctors could really figure out what was going on. You know, it wasn't arthritis. It wasn't necessarily tendonitis. They just had like this severe debilitating like shoulder, like sharp stagnation, like blood stagnation. I don't know why. I mean, I can understand why, but this herb is really good for fixing your shoulder. But it also targets even the connective tissue of the shoulder a lot. Like for tendonitis and bursitis, torn rotor cuff, it's a really amazing herb. It's used a lot topically in martial arts history for all kinds of bruising, right? Anytime you would have trauma, you would use this herb topically. This in martial arts is also the herb you get when you get the nice chest punch right into your heart that really can mess you up big time. So when your sternum gets bruised or you get a lot of times deliberately they'll slap and punch people like right here because it like shocks you and it, it can actually rattle your heart and bruise your heart internally. So it's very dangerous. Um, it's not like outlawed in the UFC because I don't like many people know it in America, but it's a really serious thing. You would always protect your chest traditionally. Um, so it's used a lot for that type of shoulder pride. I just had a guy the other day, he was so suspicious, like 50 your shoulder, okay, like whatever, you know, like it totally like resolved it too. It was so happy. Because so, he did physical therapy forever and he still like couldn't get his shoulder. It's just a it, 50 year shoulder affects only one side of your body. Too. That's how you often know it's not both shoulders. You're like one side, you have 40 year knee, 50 year shoulder, right? At 40, usually the knees will go out for a lot of people. So there's like a 40 year knee herb, right? Which is the, the type of angelica called duho. It's called, often called rheumatism angelica that we use for the 40 year knee. It often translates as oxys knee, the herb. Okay. So if you were to use it topically and internally, would you, there's no essential oil option, would you brew a strong tea and apply it that way? Yeah, you could either uh, brew a tea and <laughs> soak an area in it, like a poultice or soak a, a rag in it, yeah. Or you could just actually just dip your injured area into the water or take a bath, or you just make a tincture of it and apply it topically. Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel like there's more digestive uses, but that is the main. And by the way, when people get stomach ulcers, sometimes this pain is like severe. And we use it for intestinal ulcers too. Okay. Uh, gynecology, this is a super important herb because it, it really also targets the whole abdominal area. By the way, if you ever have an like an abdominal aneurysm <clears throat> or your abdominal artery is like partially blocked, this is like the main put that in the back of your nose somewhere. If you have a stent in your abdominal aorta because you have like a problem, uh, this is the main herb to keep and have to help that. Okay. So if that runs in your family. If that runs in your family. This is like the only herb that I know of that's absolutely specific for that. Yeah. But in gynecology, because it targets the abdomen, it's used for any kind of growth in the abdomen. So use it for uterine fibroids, ovarian cysts, endometriosis. This is one of our major herbs for all types of scar tissue. Scar tissue. Like yarrow or calendula, this would be like a Chinese version of what we would give people like after surgery, like we give yarrow and calendula to break down scar tissue, like how we give a liniment of that or take it internally. This would be the same way. Okay. <laughs> Okay, what's also unique about this plant 
is it is again one of the shin or one of the mind, nerve, or even spirit calming plants. So we're going to use this for any time we see what we call a restless spirit. What is remember what that looks like from your similar old discussions? It will be the clinical and <laughs> We're going to feel just emotionally anxious, very agitated, like this agitated emotions. You're definitely going to have insomnia, sleeping difficulty. And your mind is going to be racing and probably will have like heart palpitations or like a stuffy, oppressive feeling in your heart or chest. And probably like some type of psychological, like anxiety, depression, PTSD, PTSD especially. Yeah. So this happens a lot with PTSD. <clears throat> so anytime, this is actually one of our major PTSD. Issues. But anytime people are having emotional agitation, This is going to be one of our, our main plants we're going to consider. Okay. Um, like I said, it's really good for calming the nerves. One of the unique, one of the ways we mm -hmm. use all circulatory herbs, remember, is to help the nerves to heal quicker. So when someone's had a stroke, nerve damage, a nerve has been like Cut, like with surgery or joint replacement sometimes and things like that. Um, anytime there's damage or trauma to a nerve or a virus, like shingles maybe damage a nerve, we're going to use blood circulatory herbs to help the nerves to heal. Okay. And for that, this is one of the best because again, it's nervine and the blood stagnation, making it really unique. Hawthorne kind of does that a little bit. So this is, yeah, a little bit different than Hawthorne in some ways. The blood pressure lowering effects of this are better than Hawthorne. The effects on the heart and recovering from the heart and protecting the heart are about the same as Hawthorne. They're both like really massively researched. But this herb has more like makes the blood less thick, clotted, and clumpy. So it, it is used for blood clotting in Asia, like with injections and things. <laughs> so it's really beneficial for people that have a family history of a clot, or if you've been on a blood thinner for ever having a clot. By the way, once if you ever have a patient or a family member that has a blood clot. You know, often the medical approach is to kind of just, well, you're going to take this blood thinner for, you know, maybe a month or maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a little bit longer if it doesn't go away. And then it's like, <laughs> you're back on your way, right? But we don't think that way in natural medicine. Right? A blood clot would be like an extreme long-term process that manifests in this clot. So even after people have a clot, for at least a year, I tell people you need to do herbs that improve your circulation and blood flow. Um, so like ginkgo and this red sage would be two of the best that we would do for that. Okay. Um, also used a lot for tumors that are hard, like hard tumors and hard cancers as like a catalyst. And so it's used a lot of oncology for that purpose. Um, because it increases blood flow to the liver, it is used for uh, advanced liver disease, like hepatitis, where the liver is starting to get beyond inflammation, where it's getting like scar tissue. So we call scar tissue medically, we call that fibrosis, right? Scar tissue. So when you have fibrosis of the liver from long-term liver disease, we need this herb. We have fibrosis of the lungs from like some kind of long-term lung problem. Um, very, very helpful for. 
Um, the only other thing that I know it being used for is that it also has a bizarre effect on kidney disease because again, it increases blood flow to the area in and around the kidney. So it's used a lot for people that have poor kidney function or kidney disease. Could it help with the pinched nerve? Disc. It is often used for pinched nerves <laughs> and disc pain. Like hands fall asleep. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's good for just regular like neuropathy and numbness and that too. Um, in Chinese medicine, to go back to that, when we say something calms your spirit, we mean it calms your mind, it cools your emotions off, it cools your emotions down. It cools the monkey mind down. This is why we're talking about it today is this herb literally cools your body too. So this herb is used a lot for people that are sensitive to the heat and the humidity and summer heat. As we know, heart patients are affected the most by summer heat and humidity. So this is like a great summer heat herb. That's one of the many herbs when you research it and read about it, you're like, I just, I need this every day of my life. Like it's one of those herbs that like almost everybody could take. Um, the only other contraindication for this is we don't do it during pregnancy. Just for the simple fact, remember, we don't really do blood moving herbs during pregnancy. That being said, at hospitals in Asia, this is used in pregnancy a lot um, for like miscarriages and threatened miscarriages. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't personally use it as to yeah. be a part of my comfort level in pregnancy. There's a secret alchemical use of this herb too in Chinese history. Uh, you give this herb when someone wants to fall in love. Someone wants to hit another. <laughs> you have them take this herb. There's something to the heart that uh, either prepares them for someone or it, um, I don't know what it does to how it does it. Something. So it's to make someone fall in love, help someone fall in love. Okay. Very similar to rose in that way, right? Rose was really good for that. Yeah. I think I forgot. It's also a very powerful antioxidant. I talked about that. It's just a really cool herb. One of those great, like, Hawthorne heart herbs that you can take all summer long just to, like, kind of nurture yourself, right? There is the famous, I think we talked about it, the famous five spirit formula, right? That this is a part of. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on Don Shiny? I need to say. <laughs> well, it's really easy to grow. It's super cheap, even for like organic, good quality. Yeah. I have, I, I always know when a client has. Use of artificial sweetener because I guess they feel different. Their connective tissue feels different. Yeah. Would this help? It's like hard feeling. It's like it's not pliable. Like oh, it should be. Yes. Would this help that. This is a good herb for maybe what we would call like connective tissue detox. Okay. So would it not help if they won't get off the diet? It'll still stuff? help. Some. Okay. Yeah, it'll help compensate some, right? I just right. like figure it out. Mm -hmm. So you find with artificial, which ones, all of them, or um, like a hundred percent of the time when I ask a client after a treatment, do you drink diet soda or whatever? It's yep, I can just as soon as I put my hands on, I can feel it. That's cool. Well, not cool for them. It's not <laughs> cool for them, and it's like you know, I'm not trying to be like, well, don't do that. You know what I mean? But yeah. So that's helpful and I can say try this. Mm -hmm. Taper off the crack. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I don't think people appreciate the effects of artificial sweeteners or negative effects. Okay, so no other, any other questions with red stage or clinical applications? Um, one other question with cancer. So if it really brings blood flow in, there's sometimes always a balance of tumors between feeding the blood flow of the tumor and then, and then just bringing immune, you know, immunity to the tumor. So where does this fall with the side of cancer? Yeah, <laughs> it's not known to have any kind of an aggravating effect on blood flow as far as like increasing the, I mean, there's actually a lot of studies with it that it does like help different types of tumor growth and cancer growth. So there's probably some complementary chemistry of it that keeps that in check. Yeah, I, I've never heard of anybody. My one teacher, Dr. Chen, that was a cancer specialist who never mentioned that there's like a concern that like traditionally at all. So um, probably just has some chemistry. Good questions. Um, yeah, any <laughs> other questions? Yeah. So, um, just kind of a more broad question for more blood thinning herbs, but specifically this one. Um, if you had someone that was predisposed to like factors of blood clotting disorders, mm -hmm. would this be something they would have to continue throughout their life to keep that at bay, or would it be something that might fix it yeah. if they take for a longer period? Yep. So <laughs> let's write that. So for people that are prone, there's a lot of different clotting, like pro clotting type disorders. So there's all the well, sometimes they're called, there's different versions of it, but laden factor, there's multiple ones. Which one were you talking about? Factor two. Yeah, there's, I think there's factor two, three, four, five. I don't know all of them. But there are autoimmune conditions and genetic conditions where people are prone to clots and it makes people more prone to Alzheimer's and it causes a lot of miscarriages with women, depending on which type. This is, yeah, the blood moving herbs are going to be one of the main ways we deal with people who are inherently prone to blood clots. And it would be the same if someone just came in and said, yeah, I had a blood clot, you know, my leg or recurrent blood clot, then we just instantly think of this type of stuff. Okay. Is there a safe way to put someone on an herb like this while they're on the high dose of a blood thinner? Yeah, so if somebody's on a blood thinner, we couldn't do like a regular physical dose of this. So we could topically use the original dose like a venomant or bad. Um, or we could just do like a more energetic non-physical dose of like one to three drops, three times a day. Okay. I've even taken like where a blood clot is, like where people have their pain and just put drops of this enter on it. You don't massage, you just use your with a drop on it, just disperse over the area. Um, that can be really helpful, especially if they're really painful. So, yeah, so all the clotting disorders, um, this is going to be one of the probably top three or I mean, rosemary really excels there, and ginkgo really excels there, and hawthorn. Um, but because it's autoimmune like in a sense, it's it's even better match. Yeah. So, yeah. That's one of those things that people should get screened for too, if their family history of strokes and clots and miscarriages and stuff like that. That's super important to know. Because yeah, when you have this, like people are more prone to having like clots. And their lungs, you know, if they have like COVID or pneumonia, just the, the probabilities of those types of things are higher. So, but the person you know is just on like a heavy blood thinner regimen. Warfarin, um, heavy dose. Yeah. So the older blood thinners like Humidin and Warfarin, <laughs> just by the way, are more reactive than the newer ones like Xeralto and uh, Plavix. So to be more careful with them. 
uh, when people are on the, since I am so um, in the book, when people are on the blood thinners, why did their skin turn purple and black and yeah, it's and often all that. there's a lot of reasons. I mean, the main reason is the the blood becomes so thin and the blood vessels often get so weak from that too that when they get hit, like just the walls of the vessels just kind of like explode basically. It looks really bad. I mean, you can tell a lot more being overdosed from blood thinners pretty easily. Yeah, that's kind of one reason we know like the old blood thinners are so much worse is they're more likely to do that too where the newer ones don't do that as much, but there's different medical reasons why people would be on the old one. So I don't always understand what that is, but there's some cardiology specific conditions where only warfarin is thought to be helpful. So all, all the blood thinners work a little bit differently. Okay. <clears throat> like I said, this can be grown in your home. You can find this at Mohals. It's probably some kind of patented trademark variety, but you can probably find it somewhere. It's a perennial in Nebraska as well here. So, um, so the tea is pleasant, right? It's really reddish. It's like maroonish reddish. Okay. Got that typical earthy flavor we get from roots. But I mean, pleasant. It's not bad. Um, a really good flavor combination is to mix red sage root with the cardamom, like the one formula, or mix red sage root with red dates. That's done a lot. So long Chinese red dates. Before you start to experience changes, and can it really heal a red finger cup? Yeah, like, well, 50 year shoulder is different. It's not necessarily rotor cup damage at all. It's just a weird thing that defies kind of modern explanation. So you can expect to get pain relief from like 50 year shoulder or bursitis or tendonitis of the shoulder. I mean, usually some relief in a couple of weeks. You know, as a general rule, anytime someone's had surgery in an area, you're just talking like a slower response. So if somebody has had like the shoulder scoped in the past, or, you know, somebody's had an operation on their heart, like it's just the heart healing effects are going to be slower. Or if someone had like a surgery, like in the shoulder, the effects are slower. You know, there's, I mean, there's a lot of, old timey herbal medicine doctor masters who won't see people that have had certain surgeries because they don't think healing completely is very possible or it's much lower to their liking, you know. So famous cancer doctor in China that won't see anybody that's had any kind of surgery on their tumors or cancer. Like it's really hard to really heal after that kind of surgery, which I mean, which I understand her point at the same time. If I was definitely going to have those things cut out or anything like that. So, so, yeah, I mean, you could see effects for shoulder pain. Yeah, just a couple of weeks. It might not be like the dramatic conversion that we're looking for, but it'll get there. Other questions on red? Sage, yes, can you put that way or is there? Anything? Yeah, so red sage, about any way you get it works really well. Like the tea is good, it's tasty. Uh, the tincture obviously, we have said that anytime you tincture something, it's blood moving properties are enhanced. That's uh, true of all circulation herbs, they're stronger in a tincture format. Um, but it also works good as a as a tablet or a capsule, which you can occasionally find. I usually just use this formula because it's more readily available. Um, we also have like the powdered Chinese tea of it that's um, concentrated. That's it's pretty tasty and effective. Can I ask you about that? Actually, about those concentrated granules. 
Do you find that they have the same flavor as the raw herb or they're less effective? We just had this debate last week. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a great debate. I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time with granules and I just couldn't wrap my head around them. And I went back and forth many, 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 many times about it. And it's a complicated question. So like in Chinese medicine and modern diet, like traditionally we always did like the raw herb, which would be like the tea from the dry or chopped up herbs. And in modern times, it's much more common now to have what we call powder herbal concentrate, which we've talked about them in class where they're made and they look like a Budweiser factory. It's like a two-story tall, like basically like brewery where they're making the tea and they're capturing all the essential oils and everything. And then they cook it down until it's like a paste. And then they dry it and then the machine just like powders it. So it's in essence, you're talking about you're talking about a dried concentrated heat. So and they're different concentrations. So okay. Yeah, you get a little taster so people can taste it. So this is uh most of them are what we call five to one. So it's different. We talked about this when we talked about all the ways to take an herb. So this is a five one concentrate. So this means five pounds of an herb are concentrated down into one pound without any chemicals or solvents. This is completely chemical. So it's not like when you go to the store and buy a standardized extract of St. John's Ward or milk thistle, right? This is uh, oh, just like uh, oh, just a uh, it's one of like a scooper. Oh, so people try it. So, but what I found is that every company has totally different flavor. I tasted. It used to taste like every company's flavor. I went back and forth because some companies taste more powerful and more flavorful, and other companies are less flavorful. But you would think the more flavorful would be more constant. But however, patients' response was just all over the board, too. So I can't really figure it out because common sense says that the better it tastes, the better. Oh, this is a dung show. Good catch. Okay. Catch okay. We'll let everybody try this. So, is there no substrate? I thought there was like a substrate that they got sprayed onto. No. No, no these are just straight up concentrated. It's, I would, I thought many times about trying to invest in the thing. This is. This would be cool for this would be a great way for American couples to find like a balance. And like we said, a lot of the naturally concentrated American products that we like that are pretty rare do something like this. So because remember, nothing's altered. It's the whole entire chemistry of the plant is preserved all the way through. Nothing's altered yet. Really. Oh, this is fun. Yes. Well, pass this around. If you want to take a little shot of it, um, if you want to try this the scoop itself, we'll pass this around. If you want to put some in your tea, get no little shot and add it, you can do that too. You can just take a little bit and taste it. But yeah, it's basically an instant concentrated tea. Mm -hmm. So I often try to tell clients that because all the Chinese formulas we use are made that way. And I try to tell people it's not, you know, it's not, it's not just powdered herbs. It's like a very complicated process that 
Um, if it was done in America, it would be like literally seven times the price it is. But because it's done in China, it's quite a bit cheaper. So these are another good way. But yeah. So what was the original question, though? Did I answer? Well, yeah. <laughs> do you find that they're as effective as the powdered herbs, or whatever? That was our debate. Is that they're probably more effective than you say for our memory, form is switched several years ago from. Largely just the patterns to the concentrates, and yeah. we're not making teas or just capsules, but several of the books I was talking with said that they felt that they were not as effective as the original powders were. So, is that subjective? Like, oh, I mean, the brand change, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were tasting them and didn't, yeah, taste the, yeah, didn't they're taste still them. different, yeah. Some of them are really like whitish, sterile looking, and some of them are. Mm -hmm. I can't wrap my head around it. So I think it's just each manufacturer's got some kind of <laughs> has some kind of proprietary process they're doing. You know. Okay, so everybody's okay with this. The Chinese formulas are produced that way. Okay. Oops, no. Okay. So to me, these are like these are like a tincture because they're like a little more naturally concentrated. Uh, but the challenge is you're only getting the water soluble parts of the plant or a tincture. I geeked out a long time ago on that time with like tincture and licorice versus the tea. And yeah, they're all they're all different kind of. Um, but in theory, it's a really good thing. Probably as a practitioner, the nice thing about these powders and why I think in China they're changing is they're easy to dispense. They're easier for patients to take. They take up not much space compared to like the, having the dry chopped herbs just so space intensive, you know, takes up an entire room or this would just be like a shelf with a huge pharmacy. So. So see, this is Don Shen Shuan. So actually in Chinese medicine, things can get so geeky that this is actually, Shuan is from Southern China. So like, you know, depending on if it's from Northern China or Southern or a certain province, they'll have like a special little quirky thing. So this is Southern Chinese, I would say. So. Did everybody see that? Everybody got to try it. All right. So let's call it good with red sage and we'll go back to fibro and see how we're doing here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 